Because if so, it's not the gospel client. Amen. If I'm requiring you to do something, it's not the gospel because you never had the ability to do something anyway. Listen, guys, if you, do you guys remember, I'm just talking here a little bit. I, I, do you guys remember the, uh, just history, the Emancipation Proclamation? If you were a slave, what rights did you have? Zero. Zero. You had no rights. The guys, do you realize that's who we all were? A slave to sin and death in the throes of we were darkness itself? The gospel. Somebody ask you what the gospel is. What would you say? Well, it's the good news. Listen to me here. News means something's already happened. Don't it? And I'm just here to report to you something that has already taken place. What news? Hmm. I could just say this and, and see, I mean, we know Christ, but listen, listen, here's the good news of something that's already taken place. God himself joined himself to humanity. He became a man, a living soul, and took it into death and raised again. And when he raised up, he brought you with him. And there ain't nothing you can do about it. Because that's just who he is. Let, let, me read you, let me read you a scripture. I'm in Romans here. Romans 5 and 8. But God commendeth his love toward us. See, I, I, man, I wish we'd just get a hold of this. While we were yet sinners and slaves and in darkness and in bondage, while we were yet there, Clyde, and didn't have any rights at all, none, captives, he commended his love to how Jesus, Jesus became a man. God, I could say this. God became a man in the flesh. and was born from a virgin. Commended his love toward us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more. Much more. What do you mean much more? I mean, I thought that was it. This is everybody's preaching and got the t-shirts, John 3, 16. But Paul says much more. Be now justified. Who justified? Who justified? That's me and you. Justified how? Roger, I was a sinner. But now much more. Not that he just died. He, I mean, heck, anybody. There was two other guys there died too. But now being justified... By his blood we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if, and this is the point I want to get for, if, now this if is not a not a maybe. He, he's just, he, he's just praying, to, if then we be risen. Seeing then, seeing then may be the way to put it. Seeing then, we were in it, when we were enemies. See, we weren't only slaves, but were the enemies of God. Enemies. His very enemies. See, this is not like... See, this is, it just blows my mind sometimes because Roger, it wasn't like he just says, well, you know, heck, uh, Denise is a good person. I'm, I'm going to go save Denise because she's good. No. He went down to the enemies. Now, now can you see, you know... I mean, when he says, he talks about, you know, to pray for them that despitefully use you and, you know, turn the other cheek. That's him. That's what he did. I mean, heck, we like who likes us back, don't we? We'll do anything for people that we like and we get along with and are, 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 are birds of our own flock. Well, we kind of, oh, we give them a shirt off our back. But what about the guy that just stole everything from you? More so than that, what about the guy that just burned your house down and killed your son? 
That's what happened, wasn't it, Roger? That's the guy who now has justified us, the guys who, who were enemies, who killed his son. Paul didn't just, I mean, Paul went about killing people. But now he says, much more than now being justified by, by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through it. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, being reconciled, be your state of being right now was currently reconciled to God. Man, that's gospel. That's good. I can report that situation to every soul who lives, including you. Can I? Because he said, when I die, if I die, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all of America into me. I'll draw all the Japanese, but I'll draw all the good people into me. He said, I'll draw all men unto me. This he spake of what death he should die. So I can, in good conscience, report the gospel that all have been reconciled. And being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. My God, this man didn't just die, he rose again. And when he rose again, Clyde, the head didn't come out by itself. He got up with his full body. And when he got up, he says, Roger, you're welcome here, my friend. He says, Oakley, you're welcome here. You're welcome into what? You're welcome into the dance of God. You're welcome into my joy. You're welcome into my peace. You're welcome into my kingdom. Yes, yes. You are welcome in my beloved son. You see that? But, but see, we've got to put all these conditions and separate people and call them out and, and try to get people squared away. But he says, you are welcome here. That's what Paul is saying. See, Paul uses these, these terms sometimes, justified. Legal, legal term, and it is a legal term, but it, but I'm just giving you the other side of it. You, you are welcome here. So, so then here come, here comes faith. So, so what is, so what is faith? Then the just shall live by faith, and we know faith is beholding the sun. But, but let's get right down to it. Faith, faith is coming to the acknowledgement of, yes, I am welcome here, and amen to that. Because faith, faith, guys, we were talking about this on Wednesday night. Faith is attached to the risen Savior. Go read 1 Corinthians 15. If Christ be not risen, our faith is vain. Amen. So our faith is attached to the very risen Savior. That's what Abraham's faith began with. See that Abraham received Isaac again in a figure. Raised from the dead. How many people's faith is attached to the risen Savior? You see, man. I respond. Why do I respond? I respond because, man, I, in my mind, I just think of Isaiah. In the, in the year that King Uzziah died, what, what happened, man? The whole nation is mourning. Our king is dead, but, but I seen the Lord high and lifted up, yes. seated on a throne. Seated on a, get that in there. Seated on a throne. Work is finished. You're welcome here, Israel. You're welcome here. I saw the Lord high. His train filled the whole temple. And he wasn't there alone. He had the seraphims there with him and they were crying, holy, 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 it's the Lord. And not only that, there was movement going on in this temple because as, as he cried, the post of the door moved. I said, man, Lord, when did he cry? And he said, oh, he cried right from the cross when he said, it's finished. 
And when I began to see that, I thought, how can I be welcome here? I thought, woe is me. I'm a man. Of, I'm unclean. I'm undone. My lips are unclean. Never fret. Before I could get the words out of my mouth, a seraphim went to the altar, went to the cross, and grabbed a coal of fire, a live coal of fire. This thing is lively. All the gave you lively stones. Lively stones. A live coal. And bro, what did I do? I'm over here in this place of repentance. I'm at the altar. Oh, woe is me. Woe is me. And he's standing there with a coal of fire, put it on my lips, and said, your iniquity's gone. Your sin is purged. Yes, amen. Now being justified. Yeah. Man, the gospel, the good news. You're welcome here. And then what, what does Isaiah say? Isaiah begins to hear him speak. Who will I send? Who will I send? Here I am, Lord. Send me. Oh, I thought I was a little low-down, dirty dog. But here I am, Lord. Send me. Oh, man. Man. Oh, you gotta repent. You gotta repent. Kathy, you gotta repent. Get the sin out of your life. You know, I told him this the other day. I told him on the radio because I hear this preach. You gotta repent and get the sin out of your life. Well, let me tell you something. If you could do that, Christ is dead in vain. You would have no need of the cross. You could not get the sin out of your life. And let me tell you something. If, if, if it wasn't for Christ, tying your shoe is a sin. Because everything that wasn't him fell short of the glory of God. So I guess we all got to go to Velcro straps. Repent. Do we all need to repent? Absolutely. I'll preach, I'll preach repent, but, but, but what does it mean? What does repent mean? It means to change your mind about the way you think about Jesus. See, in the old covenant, repent means to feel sorry. Go look it up, guys. Type in repent. Go look it up in the strongest concordance. It means to feel sorry. But in the New Testament, it means metanoia, to change your mind. Change your mind about what? What you've been thinking about Jesus and God. You're not in the hands of an angry God. You're in the hands of a loving, kindness, gracious, and merciful Lord and Savior who does nothing else but want to reveal His Son in your very heart. Hmm. I mean, think about it, to repent. If he is he really the Son of God? Did he become one with humanity? Did he raise from the dead? If so, then he's what? Lord of all. I read that in the scriptures. Made him both Lord and Christ. Who made him Lord of all. That if he's been made Lord of all, then I've been reconciled. I've been saved and delivered. So, so, so what about baptism? There's another one coming that'll baptize you with the Holy Ghost. I indeed baptize you with water. But there's another coming that'll 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 baptize you with fire and the Holy Spirit. And I was wondering, I said, Lord, how how what is this baptism? I've been to the water, guys. I've been to the water. Dad is a witness. Laid me down in the Clinch River right up here below the mill dam. I've been to the water. But there's another baptism that took place a long time ago. And this is the one the Holy Spirit. He said, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. This is the one the Holy Spirit will just bring you and make you one in his baptism. Yeah. Know ye not, brothers? Many of you have been baptized into Christ or baptized into his death. Amen. Now listen, I was baptized in 1980, I think, in, in April of 1980. They didn't leave me in the water, Jeff. I got up. Why did it cost Jesus got up? And when he got up, I got up. To walk in a newness of life. As soon as you get up, though, there's people on the banks of the water that hug your necks and say, now, let me tell you what you need to do. You need to walk this way and to go this way and, and hop like this and step like that. 
I tried to hop and the stepping and the following and the going forward. I tried to do all of that. And I thought this was so good a moment ago. I felt freedom. Guys, I'm going to tell you something. I was naturally, I bet everybody in here probably has been. And there was a great freedom that came upon me at that very moment. And as soon as a carnal mind sees that, we want to put shackles right back on you. Didn't they fight that way in the war? They said, Emancipation Proclamation, we can't have people free. What are they going to do? I am indeed one with him and he is one with me. To that I say, Amen. Amen. And not only that, he, when he got up, he carried me up in his resurrection. To which I say, Amen. And I can say with Paul, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with a few spiritual blessings, with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And that one lives in you. Let me tell you something where Jesus is, if you want it. I mean, you, listen, guys, there's some things I'm going to, I won't get into all these things today, but there's some things that I'm going to challenge you with. You need to be challenged. We all need to be challenged, just like the Lord has been challenging me for two or three weeks. Go ask any American, where's God? If they don't point up, they'll say he's in heaven. I'm not denying that he's in heaven. Let me rephrase that. You ask anybody, where, where is he at? Clyde, where is he at? He's up. He's in another place. Well, Christ in you. We say those things intellectually, but they don't really mean anything. Heaven itself is in you because Christ, who is from heaven, who is in heaven, lives in you. The fullness of God lives in you. And we live like worms. We live like stupid, dumb people with nothing in this world. And we go about grabbing along like little worms eating dust. My God, you're risen out from that realm. Yes. Raised up. He died on the cross. If yes. then we, he died while we were enemies. Justified. I'm going to talk to you about something. I'm going to, I'm going to challenge you today just, just a little bit. Go with me to 2 Kings. Chapter 6. You've heard this story before. Listen, if Jesus is in the per very presence of the Father, you're in the very presence of the Father. I mean, because he went in with the blood. He went in with the stones. He, you, my friends, are in the very presence of God himself. The very presence of God lives in you. You guys know this story. I know what I know what I've always heard about this story. Let me read it. The sons of the prophets said unto Elisha, Behold now the place where we dwell with thee is too straight for us. Let us go, we pray thee, into Jordan and, and take thence every man a beam and let us make a place there where we may dwell. And he answered, Go ye. And one said, Be content, I pray thee, go with thy servants. And he answered and said, I will go. So he went with them, and they came to Jordan, and they cut down wood. But as one was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water, and he cried and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. And the man of God said, Where fell it? And he showed him the place, and he cut down a stick and cast it thither, and the iron did swim. 
Therefore said, take it up to thee. And he put out his hand and he took it. The iron did swim. You guys know that story. I mean, I bet they learned this story over in their little Sunday school lessons over there about the swimming iron. Iron did swim. Well, let's just look at this story just a little bit. If you guys got a little time. I've always, you know, we used to judge people when I would read this story and we would say, oh, oh so-and-so's accents fell in the water. So-and-so's accent, he's left his gift. He, you know, we, we did all kinds of things. He's left his accent. It's fell in the water. These things never get personal to us, do they? They never get right down in our heart. Most of the scriptures, you guys ever you guys ever read the scripture and then all of a sudden you can pick out everybody that that scripture applies to beside yourself? Oh, well, that's him. I know. He's judging everybody. <laughs> but I don't judge people. But old Johnny over there now, he judges him because I hate to get around him because he judges people. And what am I doing the whole time I'm saying? I'm judging Johnny for judging people. I'm glad I don't judge people. Do you judge me? I'm glad I hate to be around John. He's always judging people. Can't stand him. Thinks he's better than everybody else. Who does he think he is anyway? Glad my accent ain't fell in the water. Like I said, I'm building the house of God. I've got my accent. I'm on the straight and narrow. Y'all need to repent and get the sin out of your life. Ain't it funny? Ain't it good that we can laugh about that now, knowing? You see, that's why I started off at the altar. I seen the Lord high and lifted up. Woe is me. That's every single one of us. Here we go. The sons of the prophets. Who are these sons of the prophets? The sons of the prophets. You know, you know what these were. This, this was, uh, and, and you know, guys, in, in, in reading the scriptures, well, it's always a, a, this is Old Testament, but it's, it's prophetic and it's a type and shadow. These, these sons of the prophets, these, these were the, the, the school, if you will, of the prophets where Elisha would come and, and teach them. And uh, I want you to get the setting here because this is after Solomon. Solomon, they had peace, but now the kingdom is divided. Remember the northern kingdom? They went into idolatry. They're worshiping Baal. So at this time, Clyde, it's not popular to be a believer. It sounds kind of like today, don't it? It's not real popular to be a true believer. But see, Elisha would go there and he would, he would school them in how to, how to be a prophet, how to hear from God. See, I think that's something that we need to learn today, to learn to be still, to learn to listen to that voice that's always speaking, that has spoken. God has spoken in Son, and the very Word of God Himself lives in you. I think sometimes we forget about the little, the little things. But, but look at this. He says, Behold now the place where we dwell is too straight for us. I looked that word up straight. What, what does it mean? It's too straight for us. It, it, it means limited. But also, also it means anxiety. I just, I, you know, I wish I could have a thousand people here that, that could hear this thing now. Let me tell you something, guys. Have you ever been in a place where you felt anxiety? What is anxiety? What is that? Worry. Anxiety. Come on, guys. You know you have been into this place. We're in the, we're in the church, but yet we're still in a place of worry and anxiety. Hmm. Let us go, we pray thee, into Jordan and take thence every man a beam and let us 
make us a place there where we may dwell. They're telling that, that to the prophet here, uh, you know. Elisha, I know you came to teach us. This is your day to teach. This is your day to preach. But really, we're in such a place of worry. We're in such a place of anxiety. We're in such a place of limitation. Let us go back to the River Jordan. Let's go back to the River Jordan. Isn't it amazing how they got into the promised land itself? They got into the promised land itself by how? Coming through the River Jordan. Let's go back to the River Jordan and cut down some trees. They're telling the prophet this. Now, now let me just, I, I made a couple notes here that I, I got to look at. Elisha the prophet. What is an Old Testament prophet? Because I know how we got our meanings now, what a prophet is. Let, let me tell you what an Old Testament prophet is. And they're completely different than New, than New Testament. But an Old Testament prophet was the symbol of the presence of God with them. But more, they, the, the Old Testament prophet were the means and the method by which God communicated his word to the people. But even more, it was done in actions, what we would call miracles, demonstrations. Never ever think of a prophet as one who tells the future. Isn't that what we call prophets today? If I could get up here and prophesy, you know, I see somebody, oh, thou name must be Johnny, thou hast green socks on. <laughs> prophet of God. No, in the, in the scriptures, they were called soothsayers, not prophets. You can read it yourself. Prophets don't tell the future. Even in the book of Revelation, the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. A prophet here means one who speaks forth into now the word of God. They are the speakers of God's love. Demonstrators of his power. Demonstrators of his loving kindness. If they had a need, you know where they went? They went to the prophet. Listen to what I'm telling you guys. If they had a need, where do people go now if they have a need? I mean, really and truly, we got psychiatrists, we got counsel, we got everything in the world. These guys didn't have Dr. Johnson down on the corner. When they had a need, they went to the prophet because the prophet was the presence and demonstration of God who spoke the word into the present situation. That's Old Testament. That's Old Testament. Think about how much more you have now. See, we don't, because we don't see a demonstration, because we don't see this or that, we, we go everywhere but to the prophet. And guys, I'm not the prophet. But these guys knew if we're going to go down and, and cut some wood down at the River Jordan, we need Elisha to go with us. We need his... I mean, think about this, guys. They're going down to the wood. Elisha's there, and they realize... They didn't say, Elisha, stay back, big guy. We're going to go down and cut some wood, and we'll be back. They knew they wasn't going anywhere, Clyde, without his presence with them. Do you ever think of that? I'm not going anywhere. I'm just an ordinary day. I'm not going to Walmart without the presence of the Lord. As a matter of fact, you can't go without the presence of the Lord. But these guys in the Old Testament knew, even, uh, listen, I know we're supposed to be having church this morning, but we got to go cut some wood. And Elisha, you have got to go with us. Hmm. And let me
me tell you something how these people went along. I told you earlier, you've been invited into the dance, into the song of the Lord. These people went about singing. They were known for their singing and their songs. As a matter of fact, when they went into Babylonian captivity, the Babylonians wanted them to sing. They said, hey, you bunch of people singing. They said, how can we sing? How can we sing in this land? So these people, whatever they did, you ever seen, you know, I just look, I was watching a movie the other day, The Green Mile. You guys probably seen The Green Mile. And, I, and when it first came on, I seen all these slaves out there and they all had their white and black striped suits on and they were, they were picking into the ground. And you guys ever heard them people? They're all singing. When they picked cotton, they were all singing. Well, these people, whatever they did, were all in song. They were all in joy and full of it. Singing about, and it, can you imagine them going down to the Jordan and they're singing and they're enjoying the prophet Elijah's with them and they're going down to do their thing and enjoy? Now this, this Jordan River, I want you to understand just a little bit about this Jordan River. This, this Jordan River came down from the mountains of Lebanon and flowed all the way down into the, the salt sea, or I guess the Dead Sea. And by the time it gets down here to where these people were, it's, uh, it's fast, and it's deep. And as a matter of fact, I bet you didn't know this, so you can do a little history. This is the very place they went down to cut trees. It's the very place. See, I, I just love these. It's the very place that Joshua took them to cross the River Jordan. Let me, let me, I seen this this morning. I was, I was looking and I thought, gosh, oh, I mean, this is so good. Let me go, let me go over here to Joshua just, just a, a second. Let me get you that scripture here in Joshua. Uh, chapter 3. Verse 15, as they bear the ark, they were come to Jordan. The feet of the priests that bear the ark were dipped in the brim of the water, for the Jordan overfloweth all his banks all this time of harvest. I mean, can you imagine the Lord has brought them to the brink of this river Jordan at its deepest, widest point, and it's in a flood zone, and they stay there three days? Can you imagine them trying to figure out how are we going to get over this Jordan? That land over there is ours. I can see it over there, but how do I get there? I don't know. See, this is Christianity today. But, but now our intellectual thoughts, Roger, has come up with the idea. I know how I can get to heaven. I can die. Because when I die, I'm going to heaven. Because there's no way for me to get across this. I know that sounds silly, but that's what everybody thinks. When I die, one day I'm going to be over there. By God, somebody's got to step into the water. Yeah, amen. Because as soon as their feet touch the water, yes. that's what we've been talking about in Galatians. We've been going all the way back to Joshua. He says, when you see the ark, leave your place and go after it. In pursuit, high pursuit, when you see the ark. Go after it because something's standing up here. I looked at this. Now listen to this. That the waters which came down from above. My God, get a hold of it. The waters which came down from above. You're from beneath. I'm from above. Yeah. The water which came down from beneath. Yeah. He was made one with humanity. The waters which came down from above that was made one with Adam. Why? He became the last Adam. Stood up in a heap. You with me? Yeah. And rose up. <laughs> this water didn't just come down. It came down, but it rose up. Yes, yes. Get a hold of that. This water, Roger, came down and rose up. God Almighty. See, it's everywhere. It is absolutely everywhere. He rose up upon a heap very far from the city of Adam. Very far from the city of Adam that is beside Zeratan. And those that came down towards the sea plain, everything on this side was cut off. The mighty. 
see, I mean, in my mind, in my mind, I'm, I'm just thinking this is what happened in the scriptures, but I, I know literally we want to put names to these people, but it, like Abraham Lincoln making an emancipation proclamation. You slaves are free. And here, and I'm going to take it a step farther. I'm going to kill every one of the slave owners. Cut them off. And that's exactly what he did. Who were the slave owners? They were, that was anxiety. That was depression. That was uh, negative thoughts. That is every one of these things that have been your slave owners. Cut them off. Killed every one of them. Told Joshua when he would come out there and said, look, gather Israel around. See this king right here? Look, i got my foot on his throat. He's been locked up in that cave right there. While we destroyed all the other enemies, and now I want to bring him out for all of you to see. I put my foot on his throat and slew him. Let me get back over here into these verses. So we went with them, and they came to Jordan. They did. They cut down wood. Can you imagine them singing and cutting down wood? Every one of them, they're just cutting down wood and they're singing. And this is great. The prophet, the presence of God is with us. Do you guys realize that the, that the presence of God is with you right now? They're cutting down wood. Singing their songs. But one was felling a beam and the axe head fell into the water. And he cried and said, Alas. Alas. The accent is fell. Think, I just want you to think about something here. The accent. Go to Lowe's and get an axe. They just couldn't go down there and get an axe. I mean, I mean, and think about this. Think of how irresponsible this guy was because he didn't take care of the axe. And he's swinging the axe. He's doing the work. He's singing the songs. And the axe head flies off. Could have killed somebody. Flies out into the middle of the River Jordan, the deepest part, the, the fastest raging part of the River Jordan. Flies off, and now it's out there. Well, I've just got to ask you, have you ever been irresponsible? Liars? What have we been irresponsible with? Everything. But I don't know about you guys, but when I do that, the very thing that I do, Clyde, is I begin to condemn myself. I begin to call myself names. I begin to call myself a thou fool, thou big dummy. Why'd you do that for? It's what you get for thinking. See? Because we all have been in that place before. Lost our accent. And then watch the cry here. Alas. Alas. Let me tell you what, guys. I hear alas. For just about every one of our hearts, alas. This, you remember a couple weeks ago we done this, this series on emotion. This is a great cry of emotion that's coming out here. Alas, that's what it means. Alas. Oh, no. This word is used to describe uh, uh, one who recognizes their own inability. I mean, this guy cried. I mean, imagine, I mean, that's a strong, he cried a last. I don't know about you guys, but I, I just, I get in situations sometimes and I think, alas, alas, well, I have no ability here. I'm just done for. Your heart just cries out. And you know what, guys, you don't even have a prayer here. Have you ever been in a situation where, hey, sometimes I know what to pray, and I'm thinking, hey, brothers, it's time to pray. Get around and let's gather together and let's pray. But sometimes, Kathy, you get in a situation where you don't even have a prayer. Alas is the only words that can come out of your mouth. 
alas. Oh, Lord, alas. I mean, you ever just look at all the situations? And that's what this guy is, right? He's just in this situation, alas. As a matter of fact, when this guy's axe handle flies off, you got to understand, all the work stopped. All these guys were together. They're, they're one body. They're the school of the prophets. They're the sons of the prophets. And, and, and when, you know, they're all chopping and singing the song. Can you imagine that we're just singing the song? Joy to the world. The Lord is. You know, in my mind, that would be crap. And I could just see Clyde over there swinging his, and then Clyde, he's talking, he's talking to Tim, and he said, Did you see just what happened to Jim? I got his access fell off. Tim says, I know it. What's he going to do now? We come down here because we were in a place of anxiety. We were in a place of straightness and, and bondage. But now, Jim's access fell off. I know. Well, what's he going to do? I don't know. He's over there crying like a baby. So all the work is stopped. All the work is stopped. The, and not only the work is stopped, the song is stopped. Sometimes I just think we all get into that place, don't we? We get to where the song is stopped, the work is stopped, we're not going forward, we're not going backwards, we're just there. It's a, I can just see us sometimes just sitting there. Just sitting kind of sitting there. Where's your axe head? It's out in the deepest part of the water. Deepest part. I can't get to it. Mm. And, and here's what I love about this. In the midst of all of that, it gets worse. <laughs> In the midst of all of that trouble, Kathy, it gets worse. I used to say, I used to argue with the Lord sometimes because I would say, Lord, look, you've promised me you would never put on me more than I could bear. Either you're a liar or I'm super strong. And right now I don't feel super strong. Because this is crushing me down. I'm just here in the last. I don't know what. See, Lord, yeah, listen, I got, enough, I got strong enough, Clyde, where I can handle two. You give me two problems, I'm pretty good shape. But you have sit 17 my way. And these ain't little ones. This ain't, this ain't kids need a new pair of shoes trouble. This is I lost my car trouble. I lost my home trouble. Can't buy no food trouble. Somebody's in jail trouble. Somebody's dead trouble. Because what does he say? He said, man, this axe head was borrowed. <laughs> Wasn't even mine. See, and, and here's a strong word. When he says borrow, they go look it up in Hebrew. The word means beg. That means somebody had to give him the axe head who didn't want to. He had to go beg somebody for this axe head. Now, I'm telling you what, this is something of great possession here. He had to beg. Can you imagine him going to this guy and said, Roger, if you'll please, if, I'll, if you just let me borrow your axe head, I promise I'll bring it back. You know, Roger said, I don't know, man. You're pretty irresponsible. I promise I'll be responsible. I promise I'll, I'll be responsible. But, but here comes your, I finally beg him into it. I take it down and I'm singing the joy to the Lord. Boom. And I didn't take care of the axe head. And it fell off. Holy moly. How could this get any worse? I know, see guys, and I just love these things. It's not fun when you're, it's not fun. It wasn't fun for the son of the prophet here. And, and let me ask you a question. Do you know what this guy's name was? I'll give you $5 if you can tell me what his name was. I ain't even got $5. That's how confident I am to make the bet. Ain't this something a preacher makes a bet from the pulpit? <laughs> Guys, you'll not hear this anywhere else. Yeah, it's Oakland. Yeah. 
Oakley says, I got five dollars, I got five dollars. <laughs> Why is his name not mentioned, guys? Because I want you to understand this was an ordinary guy. Just like most of the scriptures are just about ordinary people. You and me. There's no need for his name to even be mentioned. And, and, and let me go a step farther. Can, can you imagine this? I mean, you guys know the end of this story, but I, I just want to say something. This, this, this event that took place, and the, the only name mentioned here, you know, was Elisha the prophet. But can you imagine them going back down to that river 40 years later and, and, or 100 years later and them telling the story, you know what, guys, this is the place where Joshua brought the, hey, you know what, also, this is the place, remember that son of the prophet? Yeah, our great-great-grandfather, this is the place the iron swam. This is that place. And I'm going to just throw this out there. This is the very place that John the Baptist laid our Savior down into the water and he rose up again. <coughs> Hmm, the iron did swim. The iron did swim. Now listen, listen what he says. But he cried, said, alas, for it's borrowed. The man of God says, where it fell. Show me, show me, where, show me where it fell. Take me. Listen to this. Take me to the place of your trouble. Take me to the place of your despair. Didn't he say to Mary and Martha that same thing? They're there in weeping and mourning. And when he says, show me where you're laying. I want you to take me to the place of your trouble. I want you to take me. Now, guys, you got to bring this over into right now. you got to bring this over into right now. Because I'm telling you something, guys. The Lord, he careth for you. You are the very place of his abode. You are the very place of his revelation of his blessed son. He careth for you. And he says, take me to the place of your despair. See, it's amazing how the, in my alas, the Lord says, I'm, I'm going to offer you something here. Take me to the place. Show me where you, you laid him. Show me where this trouble began. Hmm. See, and the prophet here, he... he He's not just listening. He's not just listening. Uh, uh, he's about to bring the love and kindness of the Father right into the situation. The love and kindness of the Father that's about, that's eager to manifest His Son in every situation. See, when I'm saying, when Paul says Christ all and in all, he really means all and in all. And when I say, when Paul says that Christ may be all and in all, he really means all and in all. I don't know if we get a hold of that. We're, we just think that's a word. But that means, guys, in your living rooms, and in your bedrooms, and in your bathrooms, and in your grocery shopping, and in your going fishing, and in your own trips, and in everything, we forget about them things. They, be, they become something over yonder. And we get, we get wrapped up in this religious garb again. But he's eager. Do you realize that it's God's good pleasure to give you the kingdom? You want to bring pleasure to God. We want to bring pleasure. Let's get up and sing God's song. No, it's his good pleasure to give. God is desiring... To give you his kingdom. The kingdom that comes with power and glory and honor. Good gosh, do we get all of this? That the father is still yet. And, oh, and how does he do it? He reveals his son because in his son is bound up all of it. And he gives that son to us. 
Already. Already. I mean, this goes back to come and see. Sir, we would see Jesus. I love what he tells John over and over. John, come and see. John, come and see. Clyde, come and see. It's what he says. Roger, come and see. Kathy, come and see. Josh, come and see. Why is he so interested in your situation? Because he's eager to reveal his son in your situation. His love is kindness. See, this situation, this situation, and listen, guys, I know I've been in this situation, probably will be again, but this situation for God, see, we're thinking of God, he, I know, that's why I say we've got to repent, because I'm looking, in my mind, I'm always thinking God is up there, and he gives me something, and i got to be responsible for it, and now I blew it, and God is sitting up there saying, I knew I should have never did that. No, go ahead. I gave him the glory and the kingdom and the power and he blew it. But see, God is, God is love. God is joy. He is kindness. And I can just see God dancing all the time looking at this situation. What do you mean dancing looking at this situation? I can just see him running around saying, man, I can't wait. What do you mean? This situation, I have a great opportunity to reveal my son here. Can you just see? See, we're down here. We're down here in what? Alas. Oh, and the angels of heaven are singing around with joy. Can you think about that? Get your heart into that situation. Oh, God, it's so terrible. And what do we do? We got a religion that stands over here and says, wait a minute, one of these days, you won't have to worry about it anymore. Great. When is that day? Because I'm wanting to get where I don't have to worry about, but it's way over yonder, and there's a great river here that's keeping me from it. See, somebody steps into the water and the thing that was keeping you from it is standing up in a heap. Standing up in resurrection that says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest and joy and peace and mind and I can just see the Lord looking around in every situation that you're in because, guys, that's how I'm here. I got here from laying on my face under the bed, crying out in despair. Alas! This is where I was, guys. Lost everything natural I could get a hold of. I was afraid I was going to lose my kids. There I was, alas, I didn't even have a prayer. But I could just see God rejoicing in the angels, angels in heaven rejoicing because now... I can reveal my son. Now he's ready to turn to me and see. I began to open up my heart or something. I don't know. I was in a last. And I heard the voice of the Lord. It's just like he cried to Elijah who was in the cave, who was in despair. Wasn't he? That's why he was in the cave. Elisha, the mighty prophet, goes about to preach and do all these things. You guys just bear with me a minute. He goes out to preach, and here comes Jezebel and says, I'm going to kill this prophet. And Elijah says, well, you know what? I've been going to church every Sunday. Nobody else is showing up either. By God, I'm just going to go over here and live in a stinking cave. Nobody loves me. Everybody hates me. I'm going to eat some worms. That could be a songwriter. <laughs> But what? The Lord didn't go into that cave right there, but the voice called to Elijah that was into the cave and said, What doest thou hear, Elijah? That's the same voice I heard in Indiana on my face. The Lord says, What doest thou hear, little Jim? Arise. What? Everybody's always telling me to repent, be baptized, get the sin out of your life, and stop doing this and start doing this. Nobody ever said, Arise. Did they, Clyde? Nobody ever told us to arise. 
Nobody ever said, come and see. But this voice did, and this was a voice that wasn't the voice of any natural man I've ever heard. This voice was coming from within. A voice that, that so much would speak and that I would hear the voice. One time I turned because I thought Zach was in the room with me talking to me. Elisha follows God's method. God always questions, don't he? That's how he comes into our hearts. Show me where it fell. Why are you here? Isn't that what he did on the, on the road to Emmaus? Because the road to Emmaus, their Savior, their King, their Son of David, their Deliverer of Israel, had just been crucified. These guys are walking along with long faces. And they come up to Jesus himself and begin to talk to Jesus himself. Don't even know it's Jesus, Roger. They don't even know it's Jesus. And they begin to say, this guy we thought was going to deliver Israel. And behold, he's crucified. You know, Jesus, Jesus just, well, I love when he uh, comes up to him and they begin to tell him, uh, he says, what thing? What things? I love how he just brings it all about. <laughs> didn't I, didn't I, oh, fool of, fool and slow of heart? Did I not tell you that this, this, this son of man, the son of God, must suffer these things and raise again? <laughs> oh. What? Jesus calling people names? You fool? See, I just, I just like, you know, when I look back at my situation that happened to me in Indiana, Kathy, I just sat there. Now I laugh about it. Now I can, I can go there in a hundred years, come on the end and say, I laid right here. Just like these guys did when they, when they came back to the River Jordan. They would say, you know, our great-great-grandpa was right here. And they was cutting trees and his axe head fell and iron floated right here. I could go back to that very spot. But right now, they're just in a lass. Can't even pray. You know, I, th I, think, I think of those disciples. Lord, I don't know if you realize this, but there's 5,000 people out there, not counting women or children. We got five loaves and two fishes. That's in a last situation. And I don't know what you're going to do, but I hope you realize that we don't have the ability here. We don't have the bill. I love what he told him. Calls the people to sit down. Just tell the people to sit down. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Sometimes the Lord will bring you in this situation. You've got no choice but to stand still and see the salvation. See, every time I've been brought into those things, that's where I've been. I've been in a place where there's a mighty red sea right here. And a bunch of enemies right here. But do you, do you realize that, that you're in the presence of God because there was a wall of fire that was right behind? There was a wall of fire that was right behind between them and their enemies. Can you, I mean, so Nehemiah, what did he do? He come back and rebuilding the city, rebuilding the walls. What are the walls? We call the walls the salvation of God. What is that? It's the boundaries of Jesus Christ in whom you live and he lives in you. brought into a situation where the men of Israel would say that's impossible it's impossible if you would have told me about my situation I would have told you the same thing that's impossible these things are small to the Lord but it was impossible I could see no way out. I could see no way. This guy could see no way. He goes to the prophet and says, Alas, my accent has fell. And it's, he wasn't going there. I mean, do you think he went there thinking, All right, Elijah, make this iron swim. Do you think he went there with that mindset? Absolutely not. I went there with my mind said, I, and, and you know, the cry of my heart was, this is impossible. It's just it. It's impossible. There's, you know, 
Lord, just rapture me out of here and get me out of here, Kathy, because this situation is impossible. Just, just deliver me and take me on yonder someplace else because that's a whole theology of Christianity, isn't it, today? We don't believe the axe can swim, do we? We don't believe the iron did swim. And because we don't believe and we haven't seen the iron swimming, we just want out. Alas, woe is me. One bad day when I get to heaven, I won't have no more troubles troubling me. Because you haven't seen the iron swim. You haven't seen the risen Savior who lives in you, who is Lord of all, King of kings, seated on his throne, high and lifted up. And where are you, Roger? Seated with him in heavenly places, in glory land already. See, we don't like to hear them things, do we? Because it's contrary to everything. But if I tell you anything else, I mean, a Paul says, lie not to one another. I can't lie to you. I must speak the truth as it is in Christ Jesus. Elisha. Here comes Elisha now. Now remember Elisha. He's the prophet of God. Remember what I told you the prophet does. He's the, he's the one that speaks the word. He was the presence of God with him. He speaks the word. He speaks the word into the situation. Speaks the now word of God into the situation. Now notice Elisha. Elisha here is in fellowship with God. Elisha doesn't ask God uh, why? He, he, he doesn't ask God, what are you doing? He, God says, cut down a stick, throw it in the water. Now think about that, guys. Here's your situation. I mean, guys, I don't know about you, but in my situation, you know what I'd be thinking of? I'm thinking of most of our, our, our problems seem to stem from money. Am I right? I took my five dollars to the store and prayed over it, Roger, and bought the lottery tickets because it's going to be worth four hundred million dollars. And if I can win that, that sounds like it's the way to go, God. If you'll just bless me, I promise you, I'll help out the folks. I'll take $100,000 of that money and give it to the church. You guys ain't laughing, but because I just won $400 million. $100,000 would be chump chase. But I'll give it to you all the goodness of my heart. Because that seems like what we need to do, but no. You said to cut down a stick and throw it in the water. Do you know how many bottles I threw in the river and throw rocks at them all the way down through there? Now he says, cut down a stick and throw it into the water. Where it fell, throw it over there. Just cut down a stick, throw it over there in the water. That sounds crazy, don't it? Throw it in the water. I mean, that's, that sounds stupid. Lord, I mean, winning the lottery would sound a whole lot better. Getting this guy some money so he could buy his own axe head would be a lot better, wouldn't it, Clyde? I mean, look, the guy was poor. He had to beg for an axe head. If this guy had money, he could buy a whole factory and make his own axe heads, and it would be so good. But no, Elisha, here's what you do. Cut down a stick and throw it into the water. You know, guys, this is Old Testament. Let, let me show you a little, little scripture here. Let me show you a little scripture here in Luke. And Luke, I, I love this. I, ha I had to, to go read this again and again and again. In Luke chapter 7, verse 25. And when the messengers of John were departing, he began to speak unto the people concerning John. What, what did you go out to the wilderness to see? What did you go out there to see? In the Old Testament, you went out there to see a stick that was cut down and thrown into the water. Because that's what Elisha did. 
Elisha was the contemporary of Elijah, whom this guy came in the spirit and power of Elijah. Why did you go out to the river? Why did you go out to sea? A reed shaken with the wind? But what went you out to see? A, a man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they are gorgeously apparelled and live delicately or in king's court. But what went you out to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and much more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face. As a matter of fact, you were looking for Elisha and all this, but he says, I'm here to tell you, this guy you went out to see is the prophet of all prophets. He's the king poobah daddy of them all. All summed up in this guy. And he went to prepare the way before me. For I say unto you, among those that are born of woman, there's not one greater than John the Baptist. But he that is least in the kingdom is greater than he. My God, you have moved from the realm of cutting sticks down and throwing them into the water into holding rods out over a sea and it parts into manna coming down on the ground into fire consuming the altar consuming the sacrifice on the altar and lapping up the water that was around the altar he that's least in the kingdom is greater than he. You have come into the very prophet of God himself. God, and at one time he spoke in diverse manner and dark sayings. But now God has spoken in Son, who is the express image of his glory. And that Son lives in you. I mean, that's the very heart of faith. The very heart of faith is, is resurrection. Jesus, the seed, rose from the dead, went into the presence of God himself and took you with him. And listen, guys, this is the greatest miracle you will ever confront. When Jesus went about doing miracles, listen to what I'm telling you. He healed a blind man. They were confronted with the miracle of we know this guy was blind from his birth but now he sees we don't want nothing else to do with him you and you and you and you and you and you and me every one of us are confronted with the same miracle that jesus god almighty became a man born of a virgin became one with humanity and was crucified died and buried and rose again. And when he rose again, took you and me with him. You're confronted with that miracle every single moment of your life. It's there always before your face till we all come to the acknowledgement. I mean, people say the age of miracles has passed, but I'm here to tell you, for you to live as Christ himself. Your very body is the temple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now listen. I'm almost finished here. What we need is a renewing of the mind. When I, what I mean renewing of the mind. We need to put off the former. The former. But let me, let me bring that down. Let me get down there where you're living. Okay? I know people that are just like this. And I know myself I'm, I'm like this uh, to a certain extent. Some people are more than, than others. But we, but we need to put off the negative. What, what I mean the negative? I, I, I wrote this down. Listen. The negative has been our safe zone. We love the negative. You think I'm lying to you? What did the children of Israel do when they got out, delivered 
from Egypt, Clyde, and came through and seen, seen the plagues, ate the lamb, seen the Red Sea, dried up, went across on dry ground and got out there. What did they do? They whined. When I was there with my face in the ground, you know what I was doing? Whining. The Lord never lets you stay there and whine, will he? Elijah, why are you here? Little Jim, why are you here? Kathy, why are you here whining? Take me to the place of your trouble. But see, that's our safe zone. Our safe zone is our, our whining. We like to complain. We like to despair. And we like to share it with our neighbors, don't we? We like to live in the realm of impossible. I know, guys, I'm challenging you right here, and I mean to. We like to live in the realm of the it's impossible. We are afraid, I'm going to use this word, of the wonder zone. We're afraid. Why did they kill Jesus? They were afraid. Why, why, were they, why were they afraid of a man that was blind but now he sees? We're afraid of the wonder zone. The whole church world has been afraid of the wonder I've been afraid of the wonder zone. I've been afraid of laying hands on people thinking, what if God doesn't heal them? What am I going to look like then? So then I, then I cut myself off and say, if it be your will. Right? I'm going to give myself an out and try to protect myself, so I'm going, to, I'm going to pray for you, and I'm going to say, Lord, if it be your will, that way I'm, I'm free. Because I like to, I don't want to live in the, in the, in the wonder zone. I don't want to live in the, in the land of the kingdom. I want to live in the land of despair. Why? There's graves in Egypt. Out here, there's no graves. Why? Because you're risen and death has no more dominion over him. Over here, I could just die and be put away and wrapped up and said, hell shall not compass me about because I died. But over here, there's not even a place I could die because I already have died. I came through death. Now I'm over here in the land of the risen. I'm over here in the land of light into the kingdom of his dear son. And I don't know how to act. I don't know how. To, so I just start complaining because I felt safe over there. I felt safe in my despair. I could share my despair with everybody else and we could all say, alas. You have come to the zone of the impossible. See, we feel more at home in our ancestor box where we've had God trapped since we came into existence. We built our little God. Go read this in Judges. We built our little God and we took our little God with us and we kept him in his little box and we rubbed the lamp little like a little genie when we wanted him to come out of that box and bless us in this situation or fix this situation and as soon as he does, if he does, then we get back in your box and I'll holler at you if I need you. safe living in the past. Why do I say that? Because we do it over and over and over again, don't we? What do you mean? We come from one trouble to another trouble and we jump into that trouble with the same despair and the same mindset, don't we, Kathy? Every time, one trouble into another trouble into another trouble into another trouble because we love it there. Because we're afraid of the zone and the realm of wonder saying the word of God. We're afraid of the kingdom. We're afraid of peace. We're afraid of joy. Because all we've known, I mean, can you imagine them slaves in 1864 trying to come out of bondage when all they knew was picking cotton? Now what are you going to do? All I've done is make bricks, Roger. Now what are you going to do? I've just made bricks my whole life, and now I'm here in the land of wonder, Josh. Now I'm here in the land I'm here in the land where all is good. I'm here in the land of light. How do I live in this land? How do I walk in this land? How do I survive in this 
relationship where I could just make bricks and I could die and we could all live miserable and cry last. How long, oh Lord, how long before you deliver us from this great mighty Egypt, this Satan that has kept us in bondage? Cut off a stick. Toss it into the water. Jesus was cut off Jesus got up from the dead, but more so than that, more so, what do you mean more so than that? What do you mean? Yeah, we know Jesus lived, but my God, know ye not, you're not your own. My God, you're not your own, borrowed, and I've wasted it, and it's thrown out into the water. And somebody's got to cut the stick. Can't. 